Hey everyone, Catch em All Collectibles here. In today's video, I'm going to give you two sides of the same conversation. Where does all this money come from? Uh, I guess we'll start a little bit gloomy. We'll start a little gloomy, but we won't stay there as long, to be fair. Just to split up the video, it's going to be a little bit shorter than normal, I think, but we'll see how rambly I get, how ranty and rambly. Uh, but yeah, so many times we ask ourselves, who is buying all these things? Why does every PSA 10 out of the gate go for so much? We know it's all going to go down. Where does this money come from? And there's so many scary studies out there. There's so many like doomsday type things. I made a video recently. Let's see if I remember to link it above where I talked about the average household budget. And this is 2022 average household budget. $20,000 a year for housing, $10,000 a year for transportation on down. It's like, where is the where does the Pokemon come from? Again, really weird. They use a category for reading, 110 bucks, 10 bucks a month approximately. Smoking, alcohol, alcohol, you got some of your vices there. You don't have you don't have the cardboard vice there. But uh does it fall into miscellaneous? Does it fall into entertainment? You only got like a few grand a year. And this is this is the average. This is the compilation of everybody. Surely there's uh there's a lot of casual people that just go and rip a couple packs from Target, Walmart, LGS, wherever. They, uh, they don't even know about graded cards. Anyways, look, looking at something like this, it's like, how am I selling $500 cards every day? $50 cards left and right. $1,000, $10,000 cards on occasion. By no means every day for that, that tier. But if you look on eBay, those cards are selling every day. Where does it all come from? All, all the studies about the average 401k balances, the median 401k balances. I mean, I know people who have... Fifty thousand dollars in Pokemon cards in their thirties, and then you look at the average, uh, the average four hundred one k balance, median four hundred one k balance, ten twenty thousand dollars. It's like, wh where does all this money come from? And uh, again, very very short little stint on because I I think I'm often painted as very bearish, yet I invest in Pokemon too. Always interesting what 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 people will uh, a lot of it's semantics too. But anyways, um. Uh, I think I'm painted as giving too much of the negative side. So let's see. Let's leave this one a lot more positive. Uh, that that's another spending one that I forgot to show. But uh, yeah, spending by family size. Some of these tabs I actually have open. I'm also working on like the the catch 'em all collectibles household budget breakdown and how that compares to like the average. And that video is still in the works. It's probably going to be a few weeks away. But uh, let let's switch. Let's flip the switch to the positive side. Only. Three minutes in, we're, we're, we're going to talk about, like, how is Pokemon not more expensive? There are, let me fix this for you. There are 22 million millionaires in the United States alone. There are 56.1 million millionaires in, in the world. I'm not going to get, like, political with this discussion at all. But there's something to be said for once your primary needs are net. Once your primary needs are met, once your housing is paid for, once you have a roof over your head, once you have food in your belly, all that good stuff, once you have transportation, you live out in the woods like me and you need a car, once all those things are met, every subsequent dollar over your needs can be spent more frivolously, right? More on collectible goods, luxury goods, more on speculative investing, whatever you want to call it. So... With this many millionaires out there, I mean, let's look up how many billionaires. With, with this many billionaires out there, 3,000 billionaires. I, I mean, we're going to look at market cap at some point very soon. There are singular individuals in this world that could just, like, buy everything. I mean, I mean, 9.7 billion cards produced. They, they could just buy all of them, theoretically, if that were feasible. If they could just call up Pokemon, pick up the phone. Hey, I'm just going to buy out every single card as it's produced. So yeah, here's another way to look at it. Shout out to the Pokenomics Patreon. We have a, uh, this was a presentation that Jake did actually about a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago, Jake did this one. And what he showed is that there is a single card in sports, the Michael Jordan 1986 Fleer. There's a $117 million market cap. And again, this was done in February of 2022. I don't know if the Fleer Jordan has gone up or down. A lot of these Pokemon cards have gone up. So a lot of them have gone down. But at the time that Jake did this comparison, there was $587 million in one basketball card alone. 
and, and Jake didn't look exhaustively at the entire market. But if I were to scroll up, he looked at Hidden Fates. I think he picked a couple sets out of each era, went all the way back, base set, first edition, Jungle, Fossil, a lot of the Watsi stuff. He looked at like dozens of Pokemon sets and all those things together, PSA 8, PSA 9, PSA 10, only came up to $190 million. So the market cap of like several of the most iconic, biggest sets in Pokemon history didn't even amount to like a third very historic, very expensive, one of the top tier cards in basketball, but like one player from one year in one set. How is Pokemon not more expensive? We're, we're doing the positive side now. We're doing like, we're, we're doing like fueling up the, uh, the, the space shuttle, fueling up the rocket for this one. Again, this is just like some general market commentary. I'm not saying that I think the prices are going to go up or down, but, uh, I'm just showing you some information and, and we'll see what uh what we think about it, I guess. Here's a, a another comparison. I did uh last week, I'm actually recording it the same night, but last week I did a presentation on uh the sales of PSA versus BGS versus CGC. This is a another snapshot of the same spreadsheet. Again, sponsored by Pokenomics Patreon. Link is gonna be below in the description if you want to see our deep data dives on different things like this. Like here, one thing that I did, I, I do compare all kinds of Pokemon, all kinds of TCGs, MetaZoo, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic. But for this demonstration, Panini. Panini is like one manufacturer. I I'm assuming, I, I think Panini Prisms are like big in basketball. I'm assuming Panini makes other products too. I, I know that a lot of things, I don't follow it closely. A lot of things are going on in uh, Fanatics and Panini and, and Tops and different lawsuits and the, the um, ownership rights of, of who gets to print the stuff is changing in the coming years. All that stuff aside, the thing that I'm trying to demonstrate is just like Pokemon is young. Pokemon is very young compared to these things. I mean, you, you talk about 1952, Topps Mickey Mantle. You talk about decades, not even that, like century. Century plus, not really centuries, but century plus of um, the, the TT06 Onus Wagner card. Early 1900s, late 1800s, we have some of this stuff going on. And, and Pokemon is like tiny rel relative to the whole thing. I mean, I wouldn't say tiny, tiny, but it's smaller than like one brand, one manufacturer. It is it is exceeding like the, the sales volume of Bowman, of Donruss, of Upper Deck, of Fleer individually. But when you look at like, uh, when you look at like PSA and the sports trading cards, Pokemon is uh, less than half of that. When, when you look at, it, it is pretty impressive that Pokemon is half. So Pokemon in the trading cards, that is all of Pokemon. That's booster boxes. That's raw. That's sealed. That's, um... PSA, CGC, BGS. So when you compare all of Pokemon in the collectible card game category, it's it's almost half. It's actually, it, yeah, it's slightly under half of like PSA sports cards altogether. But then you throw in BGS, you throw in CGC, you throw in uh, CSG, SGC. It, it's just interesting to see like the relative sizes. And I think when you look at the relative sizes, like there's a lot of positive arguments to be made. Pokemon is very young. Pokemon is like a multi-generational thing. I mean, I, King Gary... King Pokemon, one of our uh, very well-known people in the hobby. He he had a card store years ago. He was he was uh, he was at a uh, not like the target demographic age when Pokemon came out. I mean, he he was doing big things with with Ken Golden, bringing the the CD promos, bringing a bunch of different things to uh, to Home Shopping Network and all this and that, doing a lot of things to like establish the foundation of, of Pokemon being a, a collectible card game, ha having it graded, having it. Yeah, having it being graded and brought to the market, the CD promos and all that. But uh, it's it's great. I, I mean, you see people from the whole sphere. I mean, I've got two and, and five-year-old children, very into it. My wife's a teacher. Every year she has a couple kids into it. it. It's firmly implanted in a lot of us. I say us, and I'm talking about, like, generally the, the target demographic of when Pokemon came out, which I would say was somewhere between five and 15 years old, maybe, when Pokemon came out. So that would put you at somewhere between... 20, well, that puts you somewhere between 25, 30 on the low end up to maybe 45 ish on the higher end. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, people, people, the generation above us, the generation below us and everywhere in between, which, which is great to see. So yeah, more of the positive sides. Again, if you want to see like more in depth, if you want to have the whole spreadsheet uncovered, if you want to get recurring updates, spreadsheet like this only shows every quarter. 
quarter by quarter. I'm not updating this every quarter. You can see I haven't done it for all these other sports things, but uh, maybe once a year, once a year or so, I, I update a lot of these uh, different different tools that I have here, different uh, spreadsheets and data. Here's another thing here. Top 25 highest grossing media franchise, franchises of all time. Pokemon is tops. That's something you hear all over the place, but doesn't hurt to say it again in a, uh, a largely positive Pokemon video. I was doing a little bit of just general Googling of, uh, yeah, what's the total sports card, total sports trading card market cap. So many different numbers out there depending on who you're looking at, but yeah, sports trading card market size was valued at 12 point, 12, 1,600 million, so 12.6 billion in 2022, and then they're projecting it to about double by 2030. Again, whether or not you believe this verified market research, it's just a, a very positive sign. Look at uh, Collecticons, look at the National, look at all these different conventions, look at the demand, card party, all these different in-person gatherings, all the positive signs that we have towards people really being passionate about this stuff, and, and even in spite of 2020, 2021, that, that bubble, that boom, whatever you want to call it. A lot of that like really calming down. A lot of that popping largely. Maybe, maybe it shifted over to other areas. Spring, summer, spring, late spring, early summertime. A lot of Japanese cards did some crazy things. 2020 Watsi, 2021 Watsi esque And they're kind of reeling back from it now. So that said though, Collecticons are selling out in hours. The, the national is as big as ever. So a lot of positive signs. Uh... Here's another one, kind of kind of the same data that Jake had, but shown a different way. Uh, and I I think he used a little bit Pokemon price. We, we always uh, we always talk about the sources that we use to gather the data. But like like look at all of Jungle, all of Jungle first edition PSA tens, five point five million dollars. I mean I don't have that much money, but there's a lot of people that do. There's a lot of people. Once you get that seventy k a year baseline, I I've read different studies about the baseline happiness level. Every, every additional dollar has like marginal utility once your basic needs are met. Um, there are people out there making 300,000 a year, 500,000 a year, millions a year. I mean, there, there are all the, all the positive talks about, uh, it, it's kind of like a push and a pull thing. Once you get into the, the 30s, 40s, you're getting into your higher earning years. You're also potentially getting married. You're also potentially having kids. So there are certain things that can like pull your capital away from it, pull your ability to be in the hobby away from it. And certain people do go that route. Certain people sell out, sell their collections, and then fund their first house down payment. They fund their wedding, things of that nature. Uh, but yeah, again, the, the primary target demographic aging into the higher earning years, so many things that can be said for where we could potentially end up in the future. Base set first edition, total market cap, all the PSA 10s in 124, Charizard first editions. This is taking a 350,000. No website compiling data is perfect. This is Pokemon price. This is taking a $350,000 valuation for the um for the uh, the Charizard first edition PSA 10. So yeah, th this is on the high side and it's $65 million. PSA 9, base set first edition market cap, $25 million. PSA 8, I mean, when you're adding it all up, maybe $100 million or so, $100 million or so for base set first edition. There are individuals who, who just have that as excess. I mean, there are people worth hundreds of billions of dollars in this world. Not that they care about Pokemon, not that they ever will, but uh, there's just a lot of money flowing out there for sure. There's a lot of money flowing out there. And then uh, one thing that I've probably been, one thing that I've probably said out, out of context, and again, one set of data, one set of uh, information can be like, like playing a game of telephone. It can be said in one way, in one context, and then just used intentionally or unintentionally, misquoted, misrepresented. What, one thing that I've constantly like heard different numbers, whether it was 600, 400, whether it was 70%, 40%, 80%, how many Americans can't come up with X amount of dollars for an emergency? Here's a Washington Post thing. Actually, most Americans can come up with $400 in an emergency. So one thing that they say, is that the original study, I believe it came from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the BLS, like a, a government uh, entity who, I, I believe it was from them. Anyways, Federal Reserve. So it was from the Federal Reserve Survey on Household Well-Being. Even though 
60 to 70 percent of individuals depending on the year said that they do not have cash to cover a four hundred dollar emergency expense so, so that's how many say they would be able to so 60 to 70 percent say they would be able to and only 10 to 13 percent said they wouldn't be able to some amount of it is like there are very high net high net worth individuals that I mean, four hundred dollars feels like fairly low. Feels like any and anyone worth hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars probably has an account somewhere with five hundred or a thousand dollars worth of cash. But uh, generally speaking, a lot of people just invest highly. I mean, even though the average four hundred one k balances, the the median four hundred one k balances are very low. There are also like very high earners, very high net worth individuals on the higher end of those spectrums that are yeah. I, I mean, very very much higher and i mean you could have people who just have it all in their s p 500 funds you could have people who have a seven figure pokemon portfolio you can have money in a lot of forms and fashions that don't allow you to just take out four 100 dollars bills to pay for an emergency but uh it was interesting to see this study I've, I've seen this study from the negative side so many more times but uh seems like fairly overblown that that how many percent of households would be bankrupt if they were to see this cash cash expenditure? And, and one thing that I will say anecdotally, I do know individuals in this position. I do know people that are paycheck to paycheck, all this and that. But uh, some amount of those people have a lot of Pokemon too. So so it's uh, not necessary that that people won't uh, buy in spite of buy buy some entertainment, buy some luxury type things, some some feel good warm and fuzzy type things, even if their finances are not in immaculate condition. Uh, you don't want that to be a very high portion of the consumer base. And, and we'll never know. There's always speculation of what portion of the consumer base is, is um, appropriately buying these things. What are their intents? Are they collecting? Are they investing? Are they speculating? We'll never know the exact answer. But this video, it was a lot of commentary. It was a lot of ranting about not too much, ultimately. <laughs> I generally don't make videos of this nature, but uh, I am recording this in advance because I'm going to be gone for Eclecticon the weekend that I would normally record a couple days before I post. So yeah, a little bit of a change up, a little bit of a, a nice positive spin. There's a lot of money out there. And, and one thing, uh, I, I definitely say it a lot, but I don't dwell on it a lot. One thing, I'll, I'll try to link the video if I remember. Um, noise in the hobby. There's a lot of noise and negativity, some coming from me, to be fair, probably. And there's a lot of noise on the positive side, too. Ultimately, worry about things that check two boxes. I'll always say this. Worry about things that check two boxes. Can you control them? I can't control where the Pokemon mark is going. I can I can keep an eye on it. I, I can do the deep dives I do in Patreon. I, I can do the deep dives that I, I sometimes do and share in Pokemon live streams and in and, and these videos. And if and when things start looking dark, if and when things start turning to a negative fashion, I can allocate my my inventory, allocate my cash flow in different ways to like soften the blow to myself. So to an extent, I can control my feeling of it, but I can't control like the direction of where the broader market's going. And then two is it needs to affect you. Clearly, if the market tanks, if the market 10 X is, it's going to affect me. But like you need to check both boxes. Does it affect you? Yes. Can you control it though? No. Worry about it to the extent that you can control it if it affects you. If it doesn't affect you, don't worry about it whatsoever. Like if you're just, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't need to elaborate on that too much, but uh, that's going to be my video for today. I wanted to keep this one a little bit shorter. Dan video under 20 minutes. That's uh, that's on the lower end. So with that, I am returning from Collecticon. Uh, I have returned from Collecticon as, I, as you watch this video, but uh, I'm going to be live with Nick on Pokey Flips again this week and potentially a special guest. So look out for that. Other than that, I'm doing my fortnightly lives in between the fortnightly Pokey Flips. And uh, yeah, let me know any comments below. Feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to check out the Patreon. And I will catch you all later.